Modern elephants are some of the most iconic and instantly recognisable animals on the planet. With their immense sizes, impressive tusks and spectacular trunks, they capture the imagination of popular culture and wildlife enthusiasts alike, and with good reason. These intelligent social animals are a keystone species in their environments, shaping the world around them to their will, spreading seeds and clearing woodland alike. Elephants belong to an order of animals known as the proboscideans, of which they are but one taxonomic family. Throughout prehistory, the world has seen mastodons, dinotores, amabelodonts, gomphotores, and stegodonts, many of which closely resemble their modern relatives. A few, however, stand out from the crowd. In today's video, we will be looking at the most unique proboscideans throughout the course of prehistory. This is a story that will take us across the world and throughout the Cenozoic era, from the Eocene to the Pleistocene, as we meet some of the most bizarre, massive and personable animals in all of natural history. Picture yourself as an Australopithecine ape, one of the earliest members of the evolutionary branch that would lead to humans. You climb down from a tree, your feet touch the earth, and you stand upright, ready to walk through the fringes of the open, grassy woods in Pliocene Africa. It's hot, it's dry, you're hungry, and safety is never guaranteed. Eagerly, you and your troop head over to your usual feeding grounds to dig up whatever tubers and edible roots you can find in the cracked savanna soil and start the daily search for sustenance. Then, closer than you're comfortable with, you hear a sound. It's definitely coming from an animal, and a large one at that, but not one like yourself. It's a low, grumbling bellow that carries right through you. Utilizing the power of your newly evolved hind limbs once more, you stand with your head above the tall grass and scan the horizon. There it is, a hulking tower of powerful muscle and leathery skin with two sharp, down-curved tusks projecting from the lower jaw. There are a few more of them, females, within the far tree line, and this large individual, a male, is calling to them, attempting to mate as it stamps at the ground, kicking up dust with its massive limbs. You let out a warning call to your troop, and the beast turns its attention towards you. Whatever this animal is, it's dangerous, and it has begun to charge. Picking up pace, you scramble up the acacia you came from as this gigantic being hammers the trunk with its forehead and tusks, attempting to, and almost succeeding in, unearthing the tree and sending you flying. It's a stressful few minutes, but eventually the giant backs off. You'll live another day, but perhaps from the safety of the forest for a while. The beast in that very probable scenario from around two and a half million years ago in what is now Africa's Rift Valley, was Dinotherium bozasi, a species of proboscidean from the family Dinotheridae. It was just one of several species that lived across Africa, Asia and Europe in the Pliocene and Pleistocene epochs and was known to coexist with our earliest ancestors, the Australopithecines. The individual described in the previous scenario was an adult male in a state of must a state of heightened testosterone levels in breeding males that results in extreme aggression and restlessness. This behavior is seen in modern elephants, and while Dinotherium wasn't strictly an elephant, it was a Dinotherium. This behavior has been considered for the genus. To our earliest ancestors, Dinotherium would certainly have been terrifying. The name alone translates to terrible beast, with the larger species reaching heights of four meters or 13 feet, at the shoulder. They were among the largest genera of terrestrial land mammals ever to live. And while the aforementioned aggressive behavior likely took place, it was strictly a herbivore. Roaming open woodlands in search of fresh canopies to browse from, Dinotherium's most striking feature was its twin, down-curved tusks, which projected backwards from the lower jaw. Various explanations have been put forward over time as to why the animal possessed such impressive tools. And the most likely answer is that it helped them to feed. 
Both males and females grew them, and fossilized tusks show evidence of wear and tear on the surfaces. Dinotherium probably used its tusks to dislodge branches from the trunks of trees, making the leaves easier to handle and consume. The trunk was as flexible, albeit comparatively shorter, than those seen in modern elephants and would have been used to grasp leaves before transporting them towards the mouth. Its teeth resembled those seen in modern tapirs, rather than elephants, which, combined with the animal's powerful tongue, would have allowed it to feed efficiently. Dinotherium seems to have preferred the same environments as our Australopithecine ancestors in Africa. Open woodlands adjacent to savannas and grasslands. Different species of Dinotherium seem to have targeted different regions depending on where they live. European species seem to inhabit the subtropical woodland that was prevalent before the Ice Age, while those in Asia were lovers of warm forests. The European species seem to move across the continent with the gradual change of climate, following the warmest, most humid stretches of land where they could. Dinotherium evolved in Africa first and managed to colonize Eurasia when the continents became connected via land bridges. They likely evolved their immense sizes to cope with the onset of large and powerful predators in the regions they lived, such as the superficially lion-like hyaenodonts. Unlike Dinotherium, our ancestors never got the chance to meet Platybelodon, by far the most bizarre proboscidean to have walked the earth in the known fossil record. Platybelodon also was not a true elephant, but neither was it a Dinotha. It was an Amabelodont, known for their flattened lower tusks and elongated jaws. Platybelodon took both of these features to the extreme, but we'll explore that in just a moment. This proboscidean was relatively small, but scientists have not discovered enough fossil material to reliably say how small. The skull measured 88 centimeters, or 34 and a half inches in length in females, and 110 centimeters, or 43 inches, in males. Like other amebolodonts, it would likely have had a deep, barrel-shaped body and four pillar-like limbs to support its weight. Males and females were sexually dimorphic, with males being larger, sporting more robust tusks and boasting a more well-developed trunk. What makes Platybelodon particularly weird, however, is the shape and function of its skull compared to modern elephants and other prehistoric proboscideans. Its skull was broad and flat, and its upper tusks, projecting from the base of its trunk, were short and thin. The trunk in question was extremely broad matching the width of the peculiar lower jaw, but could likely still be used to manipulate plant matter. Platybelodon's secret weapon for feeding, however, were its lower incisors. The lower mandible was spoon-shaped, tipped with two broad rectangular incisors that the animal was once thought to have thrust into ponds and lakes to obtain the aquatic plants growing in the sediment. However, recent studies tell a different story Wear and tear on the lower incisors indicates that these teeth were better equipped for stripping bark from trees than obtaining aquatic plant matter. It was thought that Platybelodon would grab a branch with its trunk before digging its lower incisors into the bark to pry it off. Just like Dinotherium, it would then be able to feed on the leaves using its trunk as a hand. Platybelodon was adaptable though, and when things got tough, it is thought to have changed up its feeding habits. It was also a capable grazer of grasses that was probably able to outcompete other proboscideans due to its generalistic behavior. Platybelodon was a resident of open woodlands and grasslands in what is now the Caucasus region of Eastern Europe, with a range that spanned into Western Asia. It coincided with a time when saber-toothed cats were first beginning to appear in Eurasia and likely needed to defend itself from predation from animals such as Macaridus. The animal's weight, as well as its upper tusks, would have provided it with a degree of defense against these cats. But ultimately, Platybelodon disappeared from our world around 10 million years ago. 
This was likely down to a mixture of changes in the animal's environment, as well as competition from new proboscideans that emerged towards the end of the Miocene, the elephantids. Let's take it back to the dawn of the basal proboscideans now, to meet one of the elephant's very earliest ancestors. Numidotherium evolved in the Middle Eocene epoch, around 46 million years ago. It was a resident of North Africa and is known from a near-complete skeleton that was described in 1986. Despite its future genetic destiny, it did not resemble a modern elephant closely. Rather, it looked like a young tapir. Numidotherium measured just 90 centimeters, or 35 inches, tall at the shoulder when fully grown, and adults probably didn't reach weights over 300 kilograms, or 660 pounds. It had its roots in even earlier proboscideans, such as Phosphotherium and Erytherium, which are also known from fossil deposits in North Africa. Numidotherium was a short, squat animal with a broad, barrel-shaped body, a short tail, and stocky legs that were tipped in splayed digits, rather than the cylindrical feet possessed by modern elephants. Its short skull would have been tipped in a short, drooping trunk, similar to those seen in modern tapir species, and the forehead, due to the shape of the skull, appeared to bulge slightly. The animal's teeth were short, but the origins of elephant tusks can be seen when you take a look at the sharp incisors, which were positioned much further forward in the mouth than the animal's molars. Numidotherium's remains, despite being found in dry desert regions, indicate that it lived in close proximity to water and was likely semi-aquatic. It has been discovered alongside numerous fossil fish, which indicate that it lived close to lakes where it could obtain soft vegetation. Its fused forelimb bones would have helped it move through the water, but it was also very capable on land, where it also fed on fruits, roots, and twigs. Adopting a browsing lifestyle on land, it would have been able to get the best of both worlds and was an adaptable little creature. That being said, its size would have made it an enticing prey animal. It lived alongside an unusual predator for the Cenozoic era, Eremosuchus, a large, wolf-sized, Sebacosuchian crocodilomorph. These large reptiles were efficient, dominant predators during the Eocene and would have readily been able to bring down an unwary Numidotherium that wasn't able to escape in time. From the depths of the Eocene to the edge of the Holocene, we now travel to meet one of the most recent prehistoric proboscideans in the fossil record, and one that the first North Americans certainly had run-ins with. Measuring three meters, or 9.8 feet tall at the shoulder, Mammoth Americanum, otherwise known as the American Mastodon, is one of the most iconic animals of the Pleistocene epoch. It only went extinct around 10 and a half thousand years ago and could be found from Alaska in the north right through to Mexico in the south. Despite looking very similar, the American Mastodon was only a distant cousin to modern elephants and their woolly mammoth relatives, sharing a common ancestor around 20 million years ago. American Mastodons were specialist species, adapted to living in and around boreal forests and open woodlands across North America. While their ancestors evolved in the Old World, they migrated across to North America via a now sunken land bridge at Beringia, connecting the far east coast of Siberia with the far west coast of Alaska. From here, they migrated down, spreading out across the continent. In fact, mammoths did the very same thing, and numerous species are known to have crossed over with the American mastodon's range. With long, upwards curved tusks, similar to a modern elephant, the mastodon was able to manipulate branches and twigs, using its immense trunk to pick up its food and draw it towards the mouth. They were believed to have been highly social animals, living in herds composed of adult females and youngsters, led by a single matriarch. Males would have been solitary, roaming the wilds alone until the mating season arrived. Here, they would use their enormous tusks in competition with one another, 
vying for the right to mate with that year's females. Like much of the Pleistocene megafauna that disappeared at the end of the Ice Age, American mastodons are believed to have gone extinct, at least partly due to human overhunting. Climate change would have reduced their habitat range and food sources, putting them at risk, while human hunters trickling down from the north would have finished the job with their spears, advanced intelligence, and capacity to harness fire. Cut marks on mastodon bones indicate that early humans were readily killing and eating these great beasts, and they seem to have been particularly skilled at it. Clovis points, specially carved spear tips with a sharp, fluted shape, would have been used to pierce their thick hides and bring them down as part of a planned, calculated hunt. Given the fact that they were already at risk, the mastodons simply could not survive. Let's bring this video to a close with what may have been the largest land mammal ever to walk the earth, Paleoloxodon nomadicus, a species of true elephant that lived across the middle to late Pleistocene epoch in what is now India. In 2024, studies on the bones of this behemoth indicated that it could have reached sizes of four and a half meters, or 14.8 feet, in height at the shoulder, and that it could have weighed between 13 and 18 tons when fully grown. It's important to note that some of these estimates are speculative, as complete skeletons of this species have not been found. If proved to be accurate, this animal could outgrow what is currently known to be the largest prehistoric land mammal, the Oligocene rhinoceros relative, Paracoritherium asiaticum. In life, Paleoloxodon nomadicus would have resembled an extremely large hairless mammoth with a distinct crest at the top of the skull that anchored its muscles. It was most likely sexually dimorphic, with males reaching larger sizes and weights than females, and probably exhibited social behaviors similar to modern elephants and the previously discussed mastodons. This species was native to India's Narmada and Godavari valleys, as well as the Indo-Gangetic plain, and may even have been native to Sri Lanka, this would have meant that it was a resident of open grasslands, where it could reliably find enough tall grass to graze on throughout the day, dipping into browsing behaviors when it could. An animal of this size would have needed a tremendous amount of food to sustain it, and it likely spent much of its time feeding. Its immediate ancestor is thought to have been Paleoloxodon reki, which migrated out of Africa and into Eurasia towards the start of the Pleistocene. In Paleoloxodon Namadicus's day, India was a haven for gigantic, megafaunal mammals. Also present here alongside the former were Stegodon Namadicus, another elephant relative, as well as the large horse Equus Namadicus and Hexaprotodon, a genus of prehistoric hippopotamids. It is thought that these animals all became extinct at a similar time which may have coincided with human activity in the region. Although there is no evidence of Paleoloxodon nomadics having interacted with modern humans, some estimates suggest that it may have still been wandering the Indian plains as recently as 25,000 years ago, but older estimates place the extinction around 50,000 years ago. Prehistoric elephants and their relatives were a much more diverse group than we have discussed, even with the range of species in today's video. These strange and often large mammals were inhabitants of rainforests, swamps, grasslands, and even tundra throughout the course of the Cenozoic, and we're lucky to still share the world with them today. Given another few million years, who knows what sorts of animals modern elephants could evolve into?